Uh, today we get to dive in and we are starting our 21 days of prayer and fasting. Now, this is something that we do every year. And we do it every year to, to kick off the year, but there's a reason for it. And I want to take some time and I want to explain it a little bit uh, today. But it's about really pausing and, and dedicating this year to God, to leaning into his presence right off, the, right off the bat, right at the beginning of the year, starting it off really seeking God's plan for this year. I think one of the things that it also does is it helps us understand and learn a really good biblical discipline that is fasting. Now, fasting is something that, that it should be a part of of the life of every follower of Jesus. It should be something that, that, we're, that we're not just doing when, when we do it corporately together, but it's, it's something that we understand. And there's a moment where we get to do this together, not just so that it's the one time a year that we fast, but it's an opportunity for us to learn this discipline and the importance of it so that throughout the year, there may be moments where you're like, man, I really need to hear, um, I, I need to hear from God. I need something to, to happen. I need something to shift. And in that moment, you're like, hey, I get it. I know what fasting is about. I know why we do what we do. It should be a part of, of this discipline of, of, of who we are, something that we understand. As a matter of fact, there's a, a portion of scripture that we know as is the Sermon on the Mount. Um, it's, it's the longest just straight teaching of Jesus that we have in scripture. It's just three full chapters of the words of Jesus from Matthew 5 all the way, to Math, all the way through the end of Matthew 7. In the middle of that in chapter 6, as Jesus is talking about the different ways that we should live our life and the different disciplines that, that, that should define who we are as Christ followers, he says three different things. He says, when you give to the needy, and it reminds us that generosity is not something that is optional. It's who we are, okay? It's, 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 it's what is inside of us. He doesn't say, hey, if you ever feel compelled, this is probably how you should do it. He was like, no, 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 no. When you give to the needy, okay? It's something that we do. He then goes on and says, when you pray, this is how you pray. Again, prayer is not optional. Prayer is not one of those things that you're like, hey, when you're in a pinch, maybe, maybe ask God for some pointers at that point. Or, or maybe when you can't fully make ends, like it doesn't fully come together, ask God to fill in that gap in that moment. And he's like, no, 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 when you pray. This is, how, this is how we pray. When we communicate with God, this is what we do. It's not optional, it's what we do. And in that same vein, because I think we kind of understand generosity and I think we understand prayer, but in the same vein, in the same passage of scripture, he says in verse 16, when you fast. And I think sometimes this is the portion that we don't really lean into as much. We talk about generosity. We talk about what, what it means to, to handle our finances in a biblical way. We talk about prayer because it's so important that daily we're, we're having communion and community with God and in conversation with him that we need to lean into that. But fasting... Fasting is an expected part of our lives. And I think we, for the most part, understand how it works. I think for the most part, we, we realize um, what it is. There's, there's diet plans that cause, call for like intermittent fasting uh, and things like that. So, so it's become even more, more, more known, not even in religious circles, but it's just like people understand fasting and the detox of it and, and how that works. Maybe depending on the, the, your, your religious background or church background, you grew up um, observing Lent and you, you, there was that season where you would, you would take something and say, I'm going to give this up that was there. So, so I think we understand a little bit of, of what fasting is. I think our issue isn't about understanding what it is or how it works. I think a lot of times our issue is understanding the why. And when we don't understand the why we miss the power of what fasting is. I think that's where I want to camp for today. Why do we do this? And one of the best examples in Scripture is actually found in the book of Daniel in the Old Testament. 
I know a lot of times what we do is we, if, if, if you've been a part of this, and, and I know even for the last couple of years, Amber and I have done the Daniel fast, and, and, and we, we know a little bit of, of Daniel's fasting uh, in chapter 10. That's really where the Daniel fast comes from. It's 21 days that, that, he's, that he's praying for something. He wants God to do, to do something. And there's moments and seasons and times where, where I know that, that that's what we're looking for. But I believe when we go into this corporate fast moment of really just kind of recalibrating our, our thought process for the year ahead, a better example is found in, in Daniel chapter 1. And in Daniel chapter 1, we start to see the reason behind why we fast. So that's where we're going to camp today. You can open up your Bibles. Uh, Daniel chapter 1. Um, I'm going to start actually in verse 1. And then we're going to pause and and give a little bit of context before we get in. Daniel chapter 1 verse 1 says, In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. All right? Real quick history lesson before we move on. Because it's been a while since I've been able to give you a history lesson. And I really enjoy it. All right? So bear with me if if you don't care. Um, The year is 605 BC. The two major world powers are the Egyptian Empire and Pharaoh, and this upstart uh, empire that's raising in strength called Babylon. At this time, Judea, which is where Jerusalem is, is actually under the power of Egypt, okay? Pharaoh's come over, has, has, has taken over, so Jehoiakim which is funny, his name means um, placed on the throne by God, was actually placed on the throne by Pharaoh, all right? In this moment, these two powers are are coming together, Babylon being more in in where we would see in the modern day uh, the stands, kind of the the India side of the Middle East, and working its way towards the Middle East, Egypt coming northern Africa through the Middle East. Their borders meet, and Babylon wins the war. And at this time, Prince Nebuchadnezzar is leading the Babylonian empire, or or the military, I mean. And he's moving and chases Egypt all the way back down into the Sinai Peninsula, taking ground the entire time that he's there. When he gets into the Sinai Peninsula, word comes to him that his father has died, and he is now king of Babylon. And he says, all right, We're going to pump the brakes on pursuing Egypt. I've got to go back, assume the throne, and then I'm going to come back and finish what I started. So on his way back to Babylon, he stops through Jerusalem and has one last kick to the already defeated Egyptians. It wasn't even so much to Jerusalem because they weren't their own own city at that time anyway. Says, you know what? I'm going to stamp this out a little bit. This is actually the first of three different times that Babylon besieges Jerusalem. Because in this moment, he's trying to get back to the throne, right? His plan isn't to take over Jerusalem. It's literally like, hey, I'm going to start this, but I'm going to come back and finish it later. So he takes some articles from from the temple there. And what he also does is he takes all of the the kids from the noble family or from, from the king's lineage, So essentially, the brightest young minds, the brightest Hebrew kids that he can take, he says, I'm bringing you with, probably from the ages of 13 to 17. He says, I'm going to take you with, and we start to see why, picking up in verse 3. It says, then the king ordered Ashpenaz, I just wish, if anyone's having a baby, you should, like, there's some really fun names in here. That's all I'm saying It'll be great. Their teachers may not ever be able to pronounce them in school, but they're fun. All right, so the king ordered Ashpenaz, who's the chief of his court officials, to bring into the king's service some of the Israelites from the royal family and nobility. Young men without any physical defect, handsome, showing aptitude for every kind of learning, well-informed, quick to understand, and qualified to serve in the king's palace. He was to teach them the language and the literature of the Babylonians. The king assigned them a daily amount of food and wine from the king's table. They were trained for three years, and after that, they were to enter the king's service. Among those who were chosen from some of Judah was Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. 
The chief official gave them new names to Daniel, the name Belteshazzar, Hananiah, Shadrach, Mishael, Meshach, and Azariah, Abednego. But Daniel resolved not to defile himself with the royal food and wine, and he asked the chief official for permission to not defile himself in this way. So here's what he does. He's coming out of of Jerusalem, this Israelite culture. He's taken into the Babylonian palace, so to speak, to be educated and and to learn the literature and to learn the culture and all the things that are there. And part of that is is he's given part of the, the rations from the king's table. All right? Okay, so what he says, he says this conversation with Ashpenaz, and then if you jump down to verse 12, he just says, here's, here's, here's the test. For 10 days, give me just vegetables and water. And Ashpenaz is like, hey, I don't know that I can do this. Why would the king want to see you guys looking worse than the rest of the people? And he's like, just test me in this 10 days, see what happens. So for 10 days, he does. At the end of the 10 days, they're like, you look better than everybody else. So he says, fine, be that way. I'm going to take away the rations and you guys just get vegetables and water. So we think about this for 10 days, it was probably upwards of three years that they lived with this diet, okay? Why? Why would Daniel do this? I think to answer that question, we have to go back to why is Nebuchadnezzar trying to do what he's doing? Nebuchadnezzar, first and foremost, we see, is trying to take three years of these kids' lives, three super influential years, and teach them the language, the literature, and the culture of Babylon. Not just to make it to the point where where they, they would want to desire this culture, but so that they would forget the culture that they came from. And a big part of that was food, because Again, it's not like today where I feel like, especially in our society and our culture, and I'm thankful for this, like we all have access to pretty much the same amount of food. Like whoever's in like Washington, D.C. and leaders of our country are really eating about the same as the rest of us. It may be a little bit higher end, but we're talking like Burger King, McDonald's, all right? I'll let you pick which one's better for you. All right, here's the thing. In this day and age, the difference between what the normal person in the nation would eat and the king is light years different. Like it's, it's still to this, this, this day, there are places where what n- the normal people would eat and what people in leadership eat are, are massively different. I think the one time that I actually experienced this, I was in uh, the nation of Eswatini. It's a small country that borders South Africa and the southern, southern end of Africa. And we were there with, with a group of people from uh, the church that I was at. We were le- I was leading a missions trip. And um, there was a day, which this was a really funny day for our team because it was a bunch of people who um, we, were, we were suburban, okay, and uh, not many farmers, I'll just say that, and you'll understand why I'm saying it in a moment. And they said, all right, guys, um, we have this trench that needs to be dug over here, so you're going to go over here, and it's physical labor in Africa. And I was like, awesome, this is going to be great. Um, also, side note, Swaziland is the home of the black mamba, the most venomous snake. I don't do snakes. And they were like, oh, dig a hole in the field. And I'm like, no, I don't know that this is going to work well for any of us at all, but I did it because it was for Jesus. So that's not the point of the story I was trying to tell you. The other part is they were like, ladies, um, you're going to come over here and you're going to help the ladies because they're, um, today is, uh, is we we're working at this school where all these kids would come in and they were like, today's chicken day. And we're like, awesome. They're like, we get to serve them chicken. Um, so you're going to help um, cook chickens. But Again, we get our food a little bit different here in the United States of America. Um, when it was just before lunchtime, this farmer drove past and literally just threw some chickens over the side, live ones, okay? And they're like, no, 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 you have to catch them and butcher them. <laughs> and all the ladies were like, this is not how we get chickens. Um, 
in the United States. And it was hilarious watching some of these people like, I don't, like, I don't know how to grab it. What if it pecks me? And then you, I don't know if you've ever butchered a chicken, but the head, yeah. You might have to ask questions. So they were all like, we can't do this until there was one moment. There was one moment when one of the ladies goes, like, how, like, how often, just trying to make small talk, like, is this, how often do they do this? Is this like once a month? And they were like, oh, no, 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 no. This is probably a once a year thing for most of these kids. Like, they serve manna packs, which are, are, are rice, and there's proteins, and there's minerals, and they put different things in it so that they, they have the nutrition, but like actual meat is, is maybe once a year. And what was incredible is you saw all these like prim and proper suburban women that were like, wait a second, these kids don't get you, and it was massacre. <laughs> Something shifted where they were like, no, these kids will have chickens today. It was like, it was, it was crazy to, to shift, but I remember having conversations that night about just the difference between what we take for granted. And I was reading this story, and I'm, I'm trying to even put in context that gap of, what is, of what's happening. There's this gap of going, wait a second, this used to be something that was a delicacy, and now the king is going, hey, you can have rations from my table. And we start to see a little bit of what Nebuchadnezzar is trying to do. Nebuchadnezzar is actually, he's literally trying to wine and dine them into this lavish culture. And we start to see that Nebuchadnezzar not only was a great military mind, but he was a pretty shrewd tactician to take these kids and say, I am going to stamp out the culture that you're so used to, and I'm going to show you, and I'm going to make you desire this culture instead to the point where you forget your old culture and ultimately forget your God. Because in that moment, when you need God to be protection, Nebuchadnezzar's like, I just took out the Egyptians. You're the safest you'll ever be. When you say, you know what, I, I need God for, for my provision, he's like, hey, come eat from my table. And all of a sudden, Nebuchadnezzar sets himself up to be all of the things that they used to rely on God for. And he says, hey, come read our literature Instead of your wisdom coming from God, let your wisdom come from these influences of Babylon that are here. And what Daniel and his friends start to realize is they start to know what's happening and they say, I am not going to allow that happen in my life. I may be here. And what we see from Daniel is he serves really, really well multiple kings in, in Babylon that are there. But in, the, in that way, how he does not allow their culture to overcome the kingdom of God inside of him is he realizes and puts his priorities in the right place. There are definite times when we fast because we need something. And some of you in these next three weeks, like maybe you've got a list already or maybe you need to write a list where you're like, this is what I'm believing for. God, these are my prayer lists. This is what I need to show up. But I think sometimes the routine of fasting should happen so that we are once again reminded that our influence comes from the kingdom of God and not the culture of our society. I think so often the trap that we get sucked into is we find our wisdom from, from talking heads on, on a TV or on social media or, or people that maybe are, are entertaining and we forget that our biggest influence and our only influence should be the kingdom of God. And in this moment, even though they still had to go to class and they had to go to all the places, they reminded themselves daily with what they ate and said, we will not allow this culture to influence us. We will not take the food and ingest it. And in the same way, we will not take the culture and allow it to get inside of us because we are sanctified. We are set apart for the kingdom of God. Now, what happens? Jump down to verse 17. It says, To these four young men, God gave knowledge and understanding of all kinds of literature and learning, and Daniel could understand visions and dreams of all kinds. At the end of the time set by the king, which was the three years, to bring them into the service, the chief official presented them to Nebuchadnezzar. 
the king talked to them, and he found none equal to Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. So they entered the king's service. In every matter of wisdom and understanding about which the king questioned them, they found them ten times better than all the magicians and enchanters in the whole kingdom. So here's what we learn. A conventional life brings conventional wisdom. But a supernatural life brings supernatural power. And when we talk about, even, even when we came into this, this, came out of the singing portion of worship and into this part, and we're like, everything's changing. The miracles are breaking out. Why? Because the Spirit of the Lord is here. The truth is, that should be normal. Jesus said, greater things than I have done, you will do. In these moments, it's, it's because we have access to a supernatural power. But to access it, we have to understand the kingdom over our culture. We have to understand who he is and access to that power. Daniel realized it. I think there's so many things, so many things that, that we can pray for. But most of those things we have power over in the name of Jesus. I think it's amazing throughout Scripture. There's a couple times that it talks about in the Gospels where Jesus is, is teaching and then he's like, hey, he says to the disciples, he's like, all right, you go for it. Like, like your turn. Go out two by two into the cities that we're about to go to and do all the things that I've been doing. And you know what they did? They came back, Matthew chapter 10, they came back and they were like, Jesus, you are never gonna believe this. Like, I love when people say, like, there are times that people will come to me and be like, you're never gonna believe this. I'll be like, I bet I will. I, I'm pretty sure that it says that that would have happened and then when you, we did it, it I'll, I'll believe it. I promise I will, right? But the disciples come back to Jesus. They're like, this is crazy. Like, we can heal people with your name. Like, even the demons run away at your name. Like, this is this is." And that's when Jesus is like, hey, that's what I've been saying the whole time. And I feel like when I look at the church in America, there's so many times where I'm like, why are we not seeing what we see in the book of Acts? It's not because God has changed. It's not because he changed his mind about who he would allow to live a supernatural life. It's not, about, it's not about the access to the Holy Spirit that, that has shifted or changed. So often it's literally about us. And so often we've allowed culture to influence and tell us how we're supposed to live our life or what it's, what's acceptable in a church setting and how we're supposed to act and, 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 and respond to things. Instead of leaning into scripture and going, wait a second, the same power that raised Jesus from the dead is alive and active in me. Jesus said greater things. Do you realize what Jesus did? Like Jesus, Jesus healed lepers. Jesus was walking through the street one day and a funeral procession went, came by and was like, hey, let's make their day better and raised the kid from the dead. Like, like, these are just normal moments. Like, this is just what Jesus did. Jesus would walk past and start to say things to, to people, and people would be like, man, the wisdom that he has is so far beyond what the teaching that, 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 that we've all gotten is. It's because there's an unconventional wisdom that's supernatural. The difference is when we, lead, when we read Scripture, that's not just what Jesus did. That's who we're supposed to be. Jesus didn't come so that he could have a really cool story to talk about on Sunday mornings. He came to show us what life looks like when we are plugged into the Holy Spirit. When we live a supernatural life, when we live a kingdom-focused life and we don't allow culture to tell us what to do, our life looks like the Gospels. As proof of that, look at the book of Acts, right? Jesus ascends to heaven in chapter one. In chapter two, the Holy Spirit like fills the room and Peter, of all people, if you were taking a list of the 12 disciples and you were like, all right, we're gonna talk about which one is the wisest. 
Peter's at the bottom of that list, all right? Just read a couple of stories. Peter's always the one who's like, hey, Jesus, you know what we should do? And Jesus is like, oh, my word. Like, this has been three years. <laughs> like, right? And yet Peter steps up to the window and delivers this incredible gospel message that is essentially the entirety of chapter two. And people respond to it. And then you get into chapter three and four and they're walking around the city streets and there's, there's beggars that are going, hey, like, do you have anything that you can give me money? And they were like, hey, we're fresh out of money, but you know what we do have? We have healing. In the name of Jesus, stand up and walk. And then he starts dancing and running around. Like, like this is what the church looked like. Because they understood that even though culture kept trying to put them back in their place of going, no, 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 that's not what the church looks like. That's not, that's supposed to happen in the synagogue only, and it doesn't really look like that. Instead, they were the church that Jesus said, hey, this is what we can do. This is what we look like. And when we start to understand kingdom culture, that's what fasting does. Is it says, hey, I'm going, to, I'm going to remove myself from culture so that I can plug completely into the kingdom. Detox from culture, if you will, so that I can have a kingdom mindset when I walk through my day. That's why we fast. In Romans chapter 12, verse 2, it says, Do not conform to the patterns of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. How do we tr be transformed by the renewing of our mind? Fasting. Not conforming to the patterns of this world anymore. That's culture. So many times there's, there's culture trying to influence what's going on. And scripture straight up tells us, Romans chapter 2, don't conform to culture. Don't allow culture to, to dictate your mindset. Instead, allow your mind to be transformed. Let it be renewed by the kingdom of God. Bottom line, every one of us lives in culture. We do. We are called to culture. But we're not called to live in it. We're not called to be comfortable in it. We're called to change it. Our prayer, just like the prayer that Jesus told us to pray, is not, God, just let me make it through. Our prayer is, God, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it already is in heaven. I want to tap into heaven in my prayer life so that I can bring it to this area and shift the culture. I don't want culture to influence me. I want kingdom to influence the culture around me. I get to be the carrier of that kingdom. You get to be the carrier of that kingdom. Fasting does not separate us from food. It separates us from culture. It allows, us, allows our thought process to be kingdom-centered and not culturally influenced. That's why we fast. So whatever it may be, over the course of these next three weeks, let me challenge you, okay, to steal from Jim, not encourage, let me challenge you to do something different over the course of the next three weeks. To do something, it may be food for you. For many, it's, it's food. It's a great reminder because we eat three times a day plus snacks, right? It's a great reminder to go, nope, my stomach's not in charge. My spirit is. Some of you, it may be different. Literally, when I was reading this, I was like, you know what may be a more appropriate fast for what, like if we're comparing to Daniel, might be social media. It might be wherever you get your, your, your influence whether it's news stations, whether it's social media outlets, whatever it may be, like those influences that are on your life, to take those completely away and say, nope, for three weeks, I'm gonna plug into scripture. This will be my influence. My life will look like this for three weeks because it's a moment where for 21 days, we get to plug into the kingdom. 
I think there's so many things, even, even the good parts of our society, even the good parts of our culture. Hear me, I'm not saying everything in our culture is bad. I'm not. There's some incredible things. There's some incredible privileges that we have. There's some incredible rights that we have as citizens of this culture that I'm so, so thankful for. Even with that, we notice, if you read Daniel chapter 10, you realize that Daniel at some point goes back to eating more things, right? He didn't, his entire life wasn't just vegetables and water because he gave up some other things in Daniel chapter 10. There was a season and a moment. Not everything is bad. It's not that the, the, even the food that was there, all of it, it, was, it wasn't the food's fault. But there's times where we have to make a commitment and say, God, I need my entire influence in this season to be you and only you. And I encourage and I challenge you over the course of these next 21 days, what can you do to live a supernatural, kingdom-focused life? What can we do together to lean in and become the church of Jesus Christ? Not a church, a cultural American church, but to truly be the church of Jesus Christ, one that's, that's active in power. I love when Paul said, I didn't come with persuasive speech, but with power. It's not about an intellect or a wisdom and an argument. It's about power that we have access to. And what is it that we can do as we lean in together to this discipline of fasting? Fasting cancels culture. And it opens up a kingdom mindset that's powerful. And before we move on, I just want to ask just for a moment of reflection, just to bow your heads and close your eyes. Because in this moment, there's a few things that could be happening. But before we even go into communion, before we even talk about what it means to be kingdom focused, there's got to be a pause moment and say, first and foremost, Jesus, I need you to be Lord of my life. What fasting does so often is it kills the flesh. It kills those desires that are outside of, of the kingdom of God. Because for that, when we talk about salvation, when we talk about leaning in, it begins with Jesus with repentance, with us saying, God, I know that I have sinned. I know that I've fallen short, but today I need to turn from the way, the life that I lived before. I need to repent of the areas that, that I know weren't in alignment with your word. And at the same time, I need to make you Lord of my life. So often we love the salvation part. We love the get out of hell free card that we get from Jesus. But that comes by making him first and foremost, by making him Lord, by giving him authority in our life. And today as, as, as we're in this moment and reflecting, I just wanna ask the question with nobody looking around, if today you say, I need to make Jesus the Lord of my life. Maybe you've never done this. Maybe you've, maybe you've been a part of, of church for a long time and, and maybe you've just been playing the game. And today you're like, God, I need to be all in. Not on the fence, not kind of in culture, kind of in kingdom. I need to be all in. If that's you today, I just want to ask you right now, nobody looking around to slip up your hands so that I can pray with you in this moment right now. Thank you, I see you. Thank you, I see you. Awesome. Here's the thing. I want to lead you in a prayer today. And again, those of you watching online, I know I can't see you, but God can. And today, if, if that's you and you pray this prayer, know this, this is your moment to say yes to Jesus and to walk into the most incredible life that you could ever live. I'm gonna lead you in a prayer. It says in the book of Romans that if you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, that you will be saved. I believe by raising your hand that you believe in your heart. So I'm going to lead you in a prayer. There's no special words in scripture. It's literally just an understanding and a, and a reflection, repentance of the heart saying, I know I've sinned. I know I've fallen short, but today I give it all to you. Be Lord of my life. So I'm going to say a few words. I'm going to ask all of you in this place to repeat after me. 
One of the things we talk about about being the church and about being family is nobody prays alone here at Banner Church. We're going to pray together. But if you raise your hand, know this, today is your day to say yes to Jesus. Would you all repeat after me and say this? Dear Jesus, I know that I've sinned. I know that I've fallen short. But today I believe that you died on a cross to pay the price for my sin. That you rose again to give me life. Today I receive you. Come into my life. Be Lord of my life from this day forward. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. 